Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President and CEO of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Patricia Harrison. Oh my God. I think you've all been overserved. <laughs> what a great day, truly a great day. I think we'll be back, forum number three, planning it already. I want to thank all of our speakers and each of you for your very important and thoughtful participation. And I am more than pleased, very excited that we are ending this great day with Sarah Smarsh. She's an author, she's a journalist, she's a teacher, a media commentator. In her book, a New York Times bestseller and National Book Award finalist, Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth. Sarah writes about her turbulent childhood in a working poor family with authenticity and respect. She talks about domestic violence and addiction, but equally about the strong women in her life hard work, resilience, and pride of place. She says, I was on a life-saving mission toward a life unlike the one I was handed. Sarah grew up in Kansas, a fifth-generation farmer who rode tractors on the very same land her ancestors rode wagons. She also grew up aware of literally the worth of each penny and how important that penny could be. As she said, that's the sort of mess you want it out of. Heartland is a rural story, but it resonates as well for families in high poverty urban areas, invisible to the rest of the country in so many ways. Sarah said, I rarely saw the place I called home described or tended to in political discourse, the news media, or popular culture as anything but a stereotype that happened 100 years ago. And that's just one of the reasons that CPB is funding a local Rural Voices initiative coming home to tell the stories of people and place in a way that honors both and moves us beyond those stereotypes. But this is Sarah's story as well, and education played a major role. She did break the cycle of generations of teen mothers in her family through grit, determination, and some might say great sacrifice to pursue academic achievement. Sarah is a true thought leader who's written about poverty, socioeconomic class, politics, and public policy. And she said she aims for anything that she writes to have a backbone of civic responsibility. And public media is also part of her life. In 2016, she was a columnist for On Being, a public radio program examining meaning in the 21st century. And we connect to Sarah as well through our commitment to our education and civil society mission. She worked her way through the University of Kansas as a first-generation college student, and in 2018, she was a fellow at the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Today, she serves on the advisory board for I'm First. It's a national organization funded by the Gates Foundation that provides support and resources for first-generation college students. She's here tonight to share her insights and really inspire our thinking about public media's role in telling the story of rural America and the value of lifelong learning. Please welcome Sarah Smarsh. Thank you for such a humbling introduction. And uh, thank you to CPB and Nita and yes. and uh, yeah. Okay, I haven't been mic'd yet. Okay, that's that was too loud. Sorry. Um, thank you to all of you also who have gathered here for this important conference on the intersection of public media and education toward the greater good. <laughs> 
a mission that's close to my heart for reasons that Pat just shared, um, and I'm going to expand a little bit on that. Uh, I, I really am honored to join you tonight as a journalist and author who writes about socioeconomic class and the intersection of private lives with public forces, policy, politics, culture, history, all of those with an eye to creating a more equitable society. So I know that we have a shared mission, even though I am not uh, in your ranks in public media, and, and I kind of feel like you're my people. <laughs> and not only that, but you're my heroes. Uh, when I was in J school, I originally planned to go into broadcasting, actually. Uh, I started journalism school in 1998. And, um, and my first real champion in the media fray, actually, was a, was a longtime Bill Moyers producer who happens to be a fellow Kansas woman. Um, I ended up going down the path that was still at that time known as print. Um, <laughs> but uh, one, <laughs> one unforeseen delight of my book's release last fall um, was, was being interviewed or reviewed by um, largely women, actually, whose voices I admire in public broadcasting. So getting to talk with Michelle Martin on Amanpour and Company or with Tanzina Vega at WNYC's The Takeaway, who I know uh, benefits from CPB money, uh, and, and many others, not to mention public radio stations across the country, from rural Iowa to northern California, from Connecticut to the Deep South. I, I was talking to um, these stations, and, and some of you represent those places who are doing their best in earnest to shed light on stories that commercial broadcasting so often misses. Um, and, and on that note, by and large, it was not commercial broadcasting, but public media who has made space for my voice and my story. And I can only speculate as to why, but all I know is thank you for what you do. So it's unlikely that I would ever be on this stage. Uh, I was born a fifth generation farm kid on a Kansas wheat farm. And most of the folks who raised me didn't finish high school, let alone college, uh, due to uh, not, not lack of brilliance or, or grit, but the cycl cyclical forces of poverty uh, that had kind of weighed on our family for generations. Uh, on that note, I'm the first woman in my direct maternal line as far back as records were kept, like back to when women wore corsets to not have a baby as a teenager. And, uh, and, and on that farm, in that place, in that experience, in that class, I was so removed from any semblance of agency or power that a nice downtown hotel like this and a comfortable room and even the airplane that got me here today might as well have been Mars to me. Um, and, and so my professional path has taken me to places like this, which is a great privilege, even forms of e English, frankly, that, that, that aren't my native tongue. Um, so in some ways, I think of myself as kind of, myself as kind of holding a, a dual class citizenship, I like to say, um, that, that no one in, in the history of my family or community has held. And so part of my, journal, my journalistic responsibility and duty, I sense, thus, is to help make the distance between where I come from and where I've gone smaller. On one of my flights here today, I watched uh, Pat's morning welcome. And uh, idea after idea, my, my inner lights and bells were going off, um, conceiving of innovation, not just as technology, but changing our minds, looking at things differently, finding talent and expertise among those who might not have fancy titles. There's certainly some class implications about that charge. And uh, making a climate of inclusion, engaging and listening, instead of just a one-way sort of outreach model. And specifically, exalting local as the place where everything starts. So the reason that these ideas really sing to me is I find myself uh, having frequent occasion to challenge prevailing narratives within my own industry as a journalist about the place I come from, because so few people uh, where I'm from ever end up in those newsrooms and spaces. Um, so when I was a kid in the 1980s and a teenager in the 90s, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own media background and, and the forces that shaped me. Um, so in my farmhouse, there was no cable TV, no computer, no internet, no cell phones. This is a little bit earlier in the digital shift that's now sort of rocked our world, but um, it, but it was, certainly was a marker of class, all of the above. Uh, there were no piano lessons or, or summer camps or even trips to the public pool because that few dollars in change it wasn't something that, that we could hand out lightly. Almost no trips to the movies or cultural events. Almost never went to a restaurant. 
I remember the first time I had pizza, actually. I was in, I think, like second or third grade, and someone brought it home from a bowling alley in a nearby small town. So I lived on a dirt road. I was isolated both by geographic remoteness and by economic barriers to technology or travel or admission fees to some of the, the um, social outings I just mentioned. So here's how I, in, how I did encounter the world. Public school, which involved an hour-long bus ride each way down a very bumpy dirt road, a mailbox at the end of a long driveway to which our heroic U.S. postal carrier uh, delivered mail for the cost of a stamp, and uh, the local newspapers, radio, and a TV with four channels, one of which was KPTS Channel 8, Hutchinson, Wichita. So even amid the digital revolution, uh, economic inequality and a persistent digital divide is such that many children today live that same reality. And there are beautiful things about that reality, I want to say, lest it be pitied. Um, space to think, solitude, a real kinship with nature. But I, I happened to be a very bookish kid, and so I soaked up information wherever I could. I remember actually like reading every single word on cereal boxes uh, because my own stash of books had been so exhausted. And, and so when I sat on the floor uh, with our TV that had a, a dial that went like this and watched Mr. Rogers or Sesame Street, when my small rural school um, had the teacher wheel out a television that showed Reading Rainbow, my world opened up in beautiful and formative ways. Um, may, maybe to greater extent than, than children who had at their fingertips uh, um, more resources of information. So due in part to the economic forces that have been squeezing people out of rural areas since actually the Industrial Revolution, what we call uh, the, the, the de economic decline of those spaces actually is not a new story, but um, be because of that, and, and I was a child in the 80s, which was uh, one of the peaks of, of what is known as the farm crisis. I spent fourth and fifth grade in the Wichita School District because of we, we had to leave the countryside for a while. I, I did return, but for those couple years that I was in Wichita, um, I was in a school district that had more resources, and perhaps that's why I had the good fortune of being placed uh, in a classroom with, with a wonderful public school teacher who, who dreamed up creative ways to teach us everything from math to the constellations. And he also happened to be a playwright with a connection at KPTS Channel 8. So when my fifth grade class put on one of his original productions called Peter Pun, uh, which was amazing as it sounds, um, we didn't just perform it in the elementary school auditorium. We went to KPTS Studios to tape it. So for a kid who grew up around tractors and on construction sites, their Wichita studio was like totally dazzling and glamorous to me. And, uh, and when, when this production was aired on Channel 8, putting, putting me, my face, my person on the channel for which I was usually a viewer, for me the distance between where I was from and where I was going got smaller in a really beautiful and formative way. Today, public broadcasting is still a pillar of my life. Uh, KPTS and Wichita's public radio station, KMUW, inform me every day. Uh, as a member of this information ecosystem we're all part of and navigating, uh, KMUW hosts a great monthly town hall uh, where my, my friends and I go to discuss local issues called Democracy on Tap. And on a professional note, their station regularly supplies me an ISDN to talk to outlets around the world. Um, and actually, I knew my partner was the one when he, he poured me some coffee, coffee into a, a KMUW mug that he, had, that he told me he had for being a sustaining member. And I was like, yeah, I knew you looked good. So you might have gleaned by now that, that I actually I still live in Kansas. Um, I actually live about 30 miles away from the farm that I grew up on. I, I did live in New York for a few years. I was in Austin for a couple of years along the way, but the vast majority of my life has, has been spent um, uh, very intentionally in, in my home. Um, I write for the New York Times, The Guardian, and a number of New York-based outlets, and 
I published a book that, that I've been fortunate to go all over the country talking about. Um, and I was among many children of these, these places that we say are dying economically, who was encouraged to, quote unquote, get out for a better life. Um, so one of the more controversial decisions I've ever made was when I went back to that place that I, quote unquote, got out of. Uh, in my mid-20s, I moved back to Kansas. So why? When I finished my master's degree at Columbia in New York, this was 2005, as I said, I was in my mid-20s. Newspapers were slashing budgets and laying off reporters, and I could see that the industry I just entered was ailing in some new and vexing ways. And for some reason, rather than stay where the job was, was more assured, I returned to the place that I knew the job would be most needed. And I'm not saying it wasn't foolish on some levels. And I spent most of my 20s in poverty, perhaps because of that decision. Um, and along the way, I, I couldn't get an agent for a book that I had already largely written in a moment when nobody was talking about socioeconomic class. But because of those years, I was equipped to tell the story of my place when the country was finally ready to talk about it. And I believe that's now. So I bet there are some people in this room, um, and actually I've talked to a couple of them, who, who have felt a sense of professional and even civic duty to the place or class that shaped you. It's a place and class that intersects with your gender, race, and other identity markers in myriad ways, to be sure. But it's a feature of American life that we too often fail to acknowledge as an identity marker unto itself. We are not post-place, however digital we might be, and this country is not a meritocracy. Rather, we are a country with an abiding class structure, and place matters more than ever. From the segregating interstate that carves urban divides between middle-class whites and poor people of color to the urban-rural chasm we see playing out in politics. Last week, actually, coincidentally, I taped a piece for PBS NewsHour, um, and, and my segment, my essay that I delivered for their In My Humble Opinion series was on that latter notion, that urban-rural, red-blue divide that is such a prevailing narrative in national discourse right now, and, and here's my take on it and why I think it's relevant to you. We're a country that is divided, and I know this because I've lived in on both sides of that supposed line. We're a country divided not by two essentially different kinds of people, but divided by different information sources, different life experiences, and different cultures. So when I was a teenager in small town Kansas in the 90s, uh, conservative talk radio and cable TV were on the rise in those spaces, and sort of seizing on a moderate conservatism of places like mine, and, and the politics began transforming into a more partisan and, and more tribal affair. And today, social media, of course, it can exacerbate those sort of media silos, media silos that we find ourselves in as this information ecosystem continues to fracture and expand. Meanwhile, uh, to go back to that sort of economic collapse of local news I was talking about earlier, that in recent decades means that remote and rural places uh, were all but invisible in mainstream media for quite a long time and to dangerous effect. To live in such a place, to never feel seen or heard beyond the occasional political headline that casts your home as some sort of monolith, or a policy failure that feels like an invalidation as a member of our society. So I'm really heartened when people from, from very different worlds than mine come through, um, say, a book signing line, and they say that, that my book or my journalism opened their eyes to some truth or complexity that they hadn't previously understood. But I'm even more moved when someone who has shared a similar life experience says, Thank you, I've never seen the specific stuff of my life in a story. I've never seen my flat horizon on the cover of a book that was written in the last century. I've never read, I've never read sentences on a page that use the same words that I use in the way that I use them. So I'm often asked by national outlets to write about my place 
for readers in other places and lives, which, which is good. So they might understand someone and something else, but maybe even more urgent and what I think I'm, I might invite you all to take up as a charge is to find a way to write from and with and for the, the place. I don't want to write about the place for someone else so much as I want that story to cycle back and complete a circle of communication in a way that can be very healing, uh, in addition to, of course, informative for a local culture. This is where you all come in. Uh, in many remote and rural places, uh, I know that public broadcasting outlets are the only news agencies covering state and local government in their areas, and for some of those stations, a third or even half of their budgets come from federal dollars. You in this room have the power to bridge the gaps in our 21st century society by harnessing technology to offer wide, deep perspectives and nuance rather than sound bites that can be so destructive. You have the power to increase community understanding of ourselves and culture to make an informed society in a world where so much broadcasting touted as news is in fact entertainment or propaganda. You all know this, of course. Um, I've got some ideas about how you might do it. Some tips from, wh from, from where I stand as a fellow media maker who also calls that that population that, that my talk is tending to home. I put this sort of late in my talk because I was afraid if I opened it, you wouldn't believe me. But it's a true story. Um, just a few days ago, my, my dad came over to my house to watch the Super Bowl. And he said, uh, you know, Sarah, I cut the cord with cable. He said, you know, he had been paying over 100 bucks a month or something for, for cable television. He was telling me, that since then he's been watching so much channel at like our public radio station, uh, public TV station. And uh, he said, and I quote, I'm getting educated. <laughs> and uh, he was just so delighted. And I said, you're, you're not going to believe this, but you know how I told you I'm going to talk in Salt Lake City. Like it's specifically about exactly what you just said. Um, but, uh, but the reason I think that that point might be relevant is um, he didn't seek out that programming because of some sort of like internal setting to better himself. He spends, you know, 50 or 60 hours a week on the road every, every week as a, as a traveling construction worker at age 63, um, breaking his body and he's exhausted at the end of the day and he's lucky if he's a, asleep um, far past when the, when the sun goes down, excuse me, awake. Um, what, the reason that this shift happened in his life is because he can't afford the cable bill anymore, so it was really an economic imperative. Um, and, and I wanted to raise the point that um, for, for some of us who, who, who aren't pinching every single penny, uh, maybe some of you remember what that's like, maybe you're doing it right now, um, I like to remind myself that um, the, just the, the idea of something being free <laughs> might, might seem like a sort of silly and reductive way to look at this often very complicated business of how we attract uh, particular demographics, but, but there are people for whom um, a, a really big selling point is that you don't have to buy it. Um, and so just a reminder to people that there are no commercials and it is this free and available content. Um, you know, when I was growing up, and, and I think this is probably still true in my community, the, the term public, what, what that means and how that is charged with an idea of it being a, a, a space that welcomes all and is, and is free to all, perhaps like a library or a public TV or radio station, um, that, that sort of connotation or definition isn't necessarily held by all populations. Um, it doesn't necessarily um, explain itself. Um, so, so I would encourage that, that you just go to the very basic and seemingly obvious business of saying, uh, you, you don't have to give us any money for this. If you even have like a digital antenna on your TV, you can pick it up and it's free. Um, and it's as simple as that, that then my dad tunes in um, and, and he's a delighted audience, it turns out. Uh, I also want to talk for just a second about the concept of media literacy, and that's sort of following that, that last point that I made. 
Um, you know, I, I'm excited right now about any effort. Um, being from, from a place and, and a class that, that has, I think, been sort of more um, artfully leveraged, or some might say manipulated by particular pieces of, of the media ecosystem, um, this moment we're in, in which uh, some uh, populations are more vulnerable than others to uh, media outlets with dangerous intentions. Um, I'm in, excited by any effort uh, in public schools, speaking of education, to add to the idea of civic education the concept of 21st century media literacy. There's just no way that, um, that, that all of the good efforts that you all have in your hearts and minds will be accomplished um, now or generations from now if that sort of ability isn't, isn't uh, given to, uh, be bequeathed to our children. And um, you know, there are many uh, grown adults, of course, who are struggling with, with that very um, ability to, not for lack of critical thinking skills, but but for lack of just helpful information, how to distinguish between uh, news and information and, and biased propaganda. I also want to encourage everyone to, to expand uh, existing and prevailing ideas about a given demographic. I'm gonna give you a little story about uh, specifically the, this podcast space that we're, that we're in right now and that, that seems to be continuing to thrive. Um, Pat mentioned that last winter I spent uh, a good amount of time as a fellow at the Shorenstein Center at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and what I was doing there was developing a podcast that's in production right now, uh, that that is specifically about the intersection of health and health and rural life. And uh, and one of the spiel's that I was giving over and over again when I was getting support for that mission was that, um, you know since podcasts initially were kind of native to the, the Apple product iPhone, it initially and immediately had sort of a class marker stamped on it in terms of who might be that audience. Uh, but today, you know, uh, the, that sort of um, uh, podcasts are available across multiple platforms and, and every farmer who I know has a smartphone. Uh, people who live in rural areas are driving long, solitary highways to get from one place to another. Like there's no reason that that, that space shouldn't be um, catered to as a demographic in that realm. So I just, you know, I, I, I want to challenge everybody to, to expand ideas about, it. Are, are people not tuning in in ways because because they are um, unreachable or, or, or they don't care or they don't want it? Or, or is it because the content hasn't been made that speaks their language and attracts and, and resonates with them? So on that note, I think that the, the most important charge for uh, finding your way as, as public media makers to um, viewers and listeners is, is the content of, of the stories that you're telling prioritizing populations and places by creating media that's not just about the place, but made in and made by those places and people who know them firsthand. That's a shift that I think will truly um, change who watches and listens. You know, if you hear your own accent and your own language, um, that's, a, that's a real validation and a rare validation um, that certainly isn't gonna be happening in commercial broadcasting anytime soon. To see your, your landscape um, you don't have to say, uh, for the, I understand that, that everybody in this room has been given a copy of my book, Heartland, and I'm so humbled by that and delighted. Uh, if you read it, you'll find that you, you, while it's certainly not a polemic or a political argument, um, you might find traces of my, the, the politics that, that carry me forward today, and, um, and I'd call them pro progressive. I hear from so many uh, Republicans and conservatives who are from places like mine or who are literally from my home state of Kansas saying they loved my book, they champion it, they buy it, they give it out to all their friends. Um, you know, I said before how I think place is more important than ever. If you're from a place like that that has been erased or invisible for so long in so many ways, um, you, sharing um, the idea of home is really a tie that binds beyond so many other identity markers. And, and, and so I'm talking about in places where the, the term liberal has been weaponized and, and some might put me in that camp. Nonetheless, they are putting their arms around me and saying, um, thank you for this book. So 
I do think that while we're, we f it feels like we're in this hyper-political moment, um, validating just the, the touchstones of people's places and lives uh, can, can move mountains in, in some ways. And to accomplish that, uh, it would require, I would say, after almost 20 years in the media industry, diversifying staffs. Yes, along lines of race and gender, certainly, um, but also geographic origin and class. These things intersect, of course, as I was saying. Um, but, you know, I can, I can tell you, there, there's been times when I've, I've been in a newsroom and I'm like the only person who flags the term flyover country as a pejorative. Like that, that it doesn't feel good to be, to have that uh, term refer to your home um, if it's a place you're proud to, to live every day. And, and that's the sort of thing, that it's not necessarily leveraged with malice, but if, but if, but if you don't have someone around who could, who could pick up on, on um, that, that level of nuance of language, that's the difference between turning off a potential viewer or listener and, and holding on to them. So I've talked about how I went home and I've talked about how I think place matters today and I've talked about um, how all of this might relate to public media. Um, I've heard some, I, I have, I've heard tell that some uh, GMs in this room have sensed that calling that I'm talking about, a responsibility to tell stories where they aren't being told. You know, there's a line about New York City, which I love. Um, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Um, but I think we should pause and examine that, that language for a moment in this particular discussion. If make it, quote unquote, is about industry and maybe income and, and, and prestige or a chance at it, um, then, then there you have it. But there, there, are, there are millions of people across the country, myself included, who have stayed in or chosen to return to less sought after and maybe less glamorous places because a different set of values drove their professional decisions and that might have meant to be close to home or, or to an ailing family member or to nature. Um, and, uh, and, and I do feel like we're kind of at a moment where there's a zeitgeist of, of people um, making that proverbial return to uh, the place from whence they came maybe now armed with the, the contacts and privileges that they worked hard to earn and didn't have when they left. And I think that the next chapter of America is going to have a lot to do with that return. And some of you in this room might be part of it. Uh, last, I wanna say, and I, I will do everything in my power to join this mission, but advocating um, for, for funding for remote and rural stations is so essential. Um, when they're so much more reliant on federal dollars than, than places that have more diversified funding streams uh, and, and are thus more vulnerable to government decisions about that funding. So, as a media member who is motivated by concern for the public good and that um, civic backbone that Pat mentioned, and hailing from a community that is indeed ailing with economic struggle and I would say an infiltration of toxic media. Uh, I say there is no more important work than what those in this room are doing. So may the resources flow to you and may the true stories that you help tell reach the people who need them the most. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, I would love for this to become a discussion now. I know you've all got a million ideas, and I bet that some of them are way better than mine about this very issue. So there's a mic right there if anybody wants to uh, start a discussion. Uh, while we're waiting for someone to, uh, to do so, I'd love a show of hands of how many of you are from what you would put under the, the umbrella of either remote or rural areas originally? Well, that's a lot of hands. That's a lot of hands. <laughs>
Um, and, and something that I find in my travels, it doesn't matter where I go, if, if I'm talking at the Kentucky Book Fair and, and I'm only a few miles from a rural space or, or if I'm in the most rarefied room in New York City, I recently got to go to the National Book Awards, uh, people come up to me and say, my dad was a farmer in Nebraska or, you know, like in this country, you're, you're never too far removed from, if not a rural experience, then certainly a, an experience of, of class struggle. And, um, and, and, uh, and that's really one of the points of my book I hope you'll find is that the, the title, Heartland, is, is leveraged with some irony in that I, I think that this is all the heartland, uh, whether we're urban or rural. And, um, and, and why, that's why the bridges that you all build in your storytelling are, are so important. Hi, Sarah. I'm Becky McGurra. I was sitting with you. I'm from Cookville, Tennessee, which is very rural. And the whole Upper Cumberland is rural. So I'm also a first-generation college student and was our station's first student intern. So I'm wondering, how do you... How do you so there's so much intention now on really telling rural stories. But we still find that people who, um, they still bypass those rural communities. Mm -hmm. Even with the intention, they will still bypass it. Um, for example, and I, I won't, Ken Burns is a tremendous, uh, tremendous partner for public media and public television. But he's doing a Tennessee tour and he's not stopping in Cookville yet. <laughs> We're going to work on that. Uh, but how do you get people to intentionally, intentionally look at those areas? Mm. And by people, do you mean media makers? You know or what? I don't, because I, I think Kim Burns would be the first to want to stop. I think it's people who are planning schedules and people who yeah. are looking at how to maximize the numbers. Right. And how do you make that change? How do you start making that change so that it becomes intentional to make sure you're stopping. Mm -hmm. um, I love this question because I have found this, um, w one of the scarier outcomes of these prevailing narratives about red and blue, you know, as though they're, you look at a, a map and sure it reflects the electoral college, but I'm not sure what it tells us about our country, these squares of red and blue, as though when you cross a state line, all of a sudden, you know, you've entered a tote, like it's different people over there. And, um, and actually, if, if, if you break the country down to, to the, the county level, it, it is more about cities and, 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 the, and the rural spaces being red. But even within those colors, there's a great deal of nuance. And something that I'm frequently writing as a seeming political minority in the place that I'm from is red or blue, in general, across the country, 40% of people voted for the one who didn't win, um, which isn't nothing. You know, so... I say that because, and the reason I think it's relevant to this question, um, I find that, you know, I, I've got friends um, who, in New York who, who I have gleaned, you know, they're, they're, like, they're like tough broads, and they, they, they seem to be maybe like a little bit like literally scared to come to where I live, um, and I think this is, a, <laughs> like, we've heard there's, um, I don't know, people in overalls chewing on straw or something. And, um, and I, I think that there is this, you know, we could pay lip service all day to telling the stories of, but I, but I do think this is important that um, just like a, along all uh, identity markers, one of, one of the most um, effective bridges that we can build is, is, is truly integrating physical space. Um, and so... You know, that's part of the power, I think, of the stories that you can show on screens and that you can tell uh, over radios is to, to put people there as best they can in a way that approximate, approximates it with some nuance. Um, but, but that requires, of course, uh, journalists going into those spaces. Um, and, and it's why I think it's so important that the journalists who do have some, um, ideally, direct ownership of that place they will then tell a story um, that, that, that doesn't cast that space as a, as a stereotype that is um, potentially scary to people who might visit it. Um, so that, that's a complicated one to break down, but an important question. Thanks. Hi, Hi. Sarah. Uh, my name is Mark Leonard. I live in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, NET Nebraska, which you're probably familiar with being your northern neighbor. Yes. <coughs> um, 
I don't have a question so much as an observation. What you have said speaks to me very deeply because it reflects some of my observations. I grew up in upstate New York and I have kind of the inverse experience of growing up in a suburban, com comfortable, safe environment and it was a result of public broadcasting adopting it as a career without any sense of purpose or intention that showed me places that were so different from my upbringing that I chose it as a career and I went to South Dakota in my first job because it got out of my comfort zone mm. and showed me people that were so unlike those that I had grown up with. And I think that experiencing that and seeing the lifeline and the information lifeline that public broadcasting provided there has guided my work ever since. And so I, by choice, have worked in South Dakota, Illinois, Yakima, Washington, now Lincoln, Nebraska, not all rural, but lots of places that may be described as flyover or pejorative in other kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what crystallized for me is one of the unique characteristics of public media, which is our natural curiosity about people and things different than ourselves. And I now respond to those critics in the same way. I live in Nebraska by choice. I don't live there out of desperation, and I become offended when people say things like that. Why Nebraska? When I went home to Albany to visit people, a priest said to me, again, with, with scorn, why, why Nebraska? And there's a richness of life in, better, in other places that makes us all a better person. And I hope through our work, we're able to tell that story to the rest of the nation. So thank you for your book, and I look forward to reading it. Thank you, well said. Hi, Sarah. I'm Ron Pisaneski from Idaho Public Television. And for 35-plus uh, years, we've done this series, Outdoor Idaho, which really is sort of a celebration of what it means to live in our state. Um, and, and we've had this interesting observation where so many people, probably not dissimilar to you, leave the state to find their careers. Um, and, and the connection that we've been able to keep with them in terms of social media by them still being in touch via the programming we do. And I wondered if you had any sort of observations, not just about programming for the people who already live there, but for those who have left in that sort of sense of connection to place. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, speaking of the, the you just, mentioned a, a tool being leveraged in terms of technology for, for these, um, uh, to kind of create a co connective fiber for these um, potential stories we're discussing. There's been this, um, this isn't news to you all, but this curious thing happened where, you know, supposedly uh, digital was going to um, enable all sorts of uh, a democratizing of, of the media landscape and, and what sort of happened was <laughs> um, the, the coasts, um, really have been empowered by the moment rather than um, what potentially could be, be done with that technology to, to disperse the power of storytelling all over the country. And, and I know people in public media are doing all kinds of innovative things to try to rectify that in, uh, imbalance. Um, but I think that the, the storytelling potential there, and again, I want to go back to um, har harnessing technology for, uh, to allow people to speak for themselves and tell stories from the home rather than, um, you know, I, I know journalists in, in all walks of life and, and different iterations of media and, and by and large the vast majority of them work hard and have good intentions and are doing the best they can. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't want to throw out the term parachute journalism very lightly and, and disparage the, the good efforts by excellent reporters from New York who go into a burned-out factory town in, in the Rust Belt or whatever. Um, but, but that sort of reporting inevitably has its limitations, and there's no reason why um, people um, who, are, who are in that town, who have lived there all along, maybe there aren't any journal journalists left there, but I think any sort of storytelling that, that favors their voice and lets them speak for themselves to the greatest degree will have the greatest returns in terms of authentic authenticity and um, good effect. Thanks. Hi, Sarah. Molly Phillips from Iowa Public Television. I'm sitting at your table as well. 
And I am very similar to Becky. I am also the first in my family um, generations to graduate from college. We have had a lot of discussions recently with CPB and CP CPB staff of rural, rurality. What does it mean? Um, everybody you've heard from tonight at this mic is from a rural station. What do you believe are some of the biggest topics that we can help move the needle, solve, help, inform? What do you think? Um, I mentioned that the podcast that I've been developing is, is in the realm of health. Um, I think that that's the, the imminent crisis in those places, and that, of course, has economic um, causes. But the closure of rural hospitals, and, and that's very much a story about expansion or lack thereof of Medicare, um, that, that is the story that, um, for people who live in those areas, um, tr transcends even politics in some ways that might surprise you. Um, the second I would say would be, um, it's kind of twofold. On the one hand, um, telling, st revealing stories about those places that are not placed within a political framework. Um, you know, there, one marker um, or, or, or one thing that sort of denotes privilege, I find, and this might be along lines of, of race or gender, and, and in, in this case I'm talking about place or class, is if, if you get to just be a story and it isn't contained within some sort of very highly politicized framework. Um, and so to, to constantly in every story um, be connected to the 2016 presidential election um, is in, you know, that, that is an, an important American dis discussion, but I think we've had plenty of it and it will go on. Um, and there are so many important stories to be told that in people's day-to-day -day lives, you know, for that matter, um, the, what you know, people in this room are highly engaged in, in political discussion and, and are up on the news and are in the business of conveying the news. It's easy to forget how the extent to which for the average person's day-to-day -day life, and, and I can tell you certainly for members of the working poor, it, it is a privilege to be so well informed and to be so civically engaged. Uh, many people lack um, the time or information to be thus. and. Um, and, and so to sort of like impose upon every life experience, and, and I'm talking now about these, you know, like um, safaris into rural areas by media outlets. Um, <laughs> it's like we're getting to the bottom of 2016, guys. Uh, it's, um, it, it's troubling to me because it, it, it tends to be dehumanizing. And so I would say, um, but, but the, the second piece of that and the second story, in addition to health, that I think is is under discussed or under told, is is the political diversity of those places. So I know some of the most radical progressives I know are in places that are uh, th that are in rural spaces that are that are called red, um, and those stories don't get told because it's it's not easy in the pat narrative that is a, a conflict driven story that 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 drives up ratings um, for cable TV uh, but it's an important one and um, and I would also say uh, you know I'm a little bit biased on this because I grew up on a wheat farm but um, good reporting about agriculture I think the an important opportunity there is to you know, I think some people are like worn out the last couple of years of saying, okay, well now there, there's the, um, this uh, obsession with, um, you know, people in rural Nebraska or whatever and a, a kind of hyper awareness of that demographic that, that, that might have swung an election. Um, the, the thing about, um, that, that is so often missed, I think, in, in reporting about rural is that rural affects urban and urban affects rural. And it isn't just contained and it isn't just you cross a line and then you're in that space. And one way to make that connection for a, a diverse population across the country is to talk about food because we all eat it. I helped grow it. My hands bled pulling rye out of the wheat fields that made the bread that this country ate. And it kills me when I see um, things like the farm bill just sort of like um, put over in a, in a tidy category as rural when, when we've got to find ways to tell these stories that make 
um, people across the country understand what's at stake for our earth, our environment, our bodies, our health, and that's all of us. And it starts in rural America, and they're the stewards of and often the victims of, uh, in many ways, um, the, the corporate um, forces that have compromised that industry. So those are, those are my three votes for that one. Thank you. So Sarah, this will be our last question. Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Mark Bork from Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I couldn't help it as you were speaking, I thought of Judy Garland in her final scene, there's no place like home. And then realized that was Kansas as well. <laughs> but uh, the, my question to you is, I was so moved by what you said about the Republican contingency embracing you because of that commonality. You know, we're in such a divide and there's such a gap and what are the other things that you're experiencing or you're seeing that can bridge that gap? And you mentioned some just now, but, and then two, two part question. Not only what, what are more examples that can bridge that? Are you hopeful? Are you tentative for the future of that gap? Can we get back to discussion and instead of the vitriol? that we all experience? Well, I'm going to answer the second part of that great question first because it's so uh, pertinent to you all. Um, I truly believe, and maybe not surprisingly from my vantage as a journalist, but I absolutely believe that whether it is hope or despair in terms of that, that gap widening or narrowing has everything to do with whether um, the um, uh, fractured information sources um, that this country turns to is somehow rectified or righted in a way that we at least have a common language or framework. So one example I can give you is, um, um, you know, I know a lot of a lot of women, strong women, tough women who live and um, embody the tenets of feminism every day in their day-to-day -day lives in uh, among the rural working poor. And yet they would be hesitant to use the term f feminism because um, they, where they get their information and their news um, has uh, weaponized that term and um, uh, turned it into something that's derogatory. So, so when we, and, and then for, for a woman with, with a different information source and, and maybe a different education and a different life experience, she wears that term proudly on her t-shirt and maybe doesn't even walk the walk of it as well as that woman I'm talking about in the country. So for me, and as a, as a writer and someone for whom um, uh, articulating the problem is so so crucial to solving it, um, finding a, a common set of definitions and a language that we can all share as a society is crucial, and that can only happen uh, by, by solving problems at the level of, of production and where you all reside professionally. Um, as far as, as how, um, then, potentially the, those conversations happen and those bridges are made, um, there are a couple of things, and, and one might seem counter to our charge as, as uh, storytellers within media, but, um, but, but I think that anything that can be done by, by public media to actually, and again, this might be counterintuitive, but stay with me, get away from screens for a moment. So I talked about how KMUW, um, the, our NPR affiliate in Wichita, hosts these um, monthly town hall meetings to, to discuss hyper-local, very local issues, like what are they gonna do with that landmark that's getting torn down downtown? And um, uh, it's called Democracy on Tap. We gather in an old local theater, uh, people drink, there's a, a panel of, of great speakers and, and, and people from all walks of life all over Wichita come. And, and then they tune in to KMUW to, to hear more about it and, and, and so, but, but I think the reason that that's important in this, this thing about um, healing divides is, is um, and I think uh, the, the sociologist and writer uh, Brene Brown said this, it's hard to hate up close. And, and stepping away from screens for a moment to look people in the eye, which, by the way, is an experience that might be taken for granted in some ways in a more densely populated area, in an urban area, but, to be, but, but the sort of geographic isolation that I was describing in my talk um, is, is very real and, and makes one potentially more vulnerable to um, the, the kind of um, tribal impulses that we see materialize on social media when uh, people are just attacking one another rather than listening. 
Um, and, and the second piece of that, I think, is just um, to, you know, again, to go back to my talk, the, the content that is created. If it is, um, you know, w one of the questions earlier was about, uh, you know, having a, a sense of, um, a I, I might even say bitterness or a little chip on the shoulder about the way one has been misrepresented by and large in in media um, that that makes a pocket of society ripe for uh, manipulation and and propaganda in the wrong direction and so getting the story right it, it might sound too simple but I think that um, getting the story right with nuance and the sort of depth and with that, that you all have the space to do in a way that um, those beholden to more commercial forces uh, can't um, is is healing in and of itself, and and will do the work in many ways of reverberating through society with uh, a, what what brings us together rather than uh, what separates us. Thank you so much. This has been great. So great. Thank so you wonderful. So much. This was beyond what I had hoped for. And I just said to Sarah, we'd all be thrilled if you just talked another two hours. Um, speaking on behalf of everyone here, we're proud to welcome you into our public media family. And we will be working with you in the future. Thank you so much, Sarah. As you all know, uh, yes. These things are really bothering me. As you all know, the end of the forum today is not the end of the forum. And we'll be in touch with you to get your input, your comments, and work with you on the next innovation uh, grant process and also on um, Thought Leader Forum number three. Earlier today, I talked about our great CPV team. And tonight, I'd really just like to take a moment to thank them individually and ask them to come up here so you could take a look at the people who worked on this for months and months and months. They are thought leaders in their own right. And in alphabetical order, Stephanie, <laughs> Stephanie Aronson. <laughs> Sarah Bean. <laughs> Megan Fitzpatrick. Michael Fregale, Elise Garfingel, Tish King, Camille Morgan, Teresa Safan, Deb Sanchez, Helen Savage, and our board member, Liz Sembler. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you, guys. Where is Liz? Where are you? Get here. All right, we'll be back next.